closer. Something's... No, what? Hi everyone, Lun here, and welcome back to another video. In this one, I'm going over a 100% completion review of Atlas Fallen, a mostly open world action RPG that has plenty of co-op options, and I'm making this review after completing the game 100%, so that way I can give you a very much full explanation of the game, since I play the game to 100% completion to make guides anyway, and it also gives you a perspective of a game that most reviewers won't cover as they do the reviews fairly quickly. But I have done everything the game has to offer, all the missions, all the collectibles, completed every achievement, and I've done the game from start to finish. The developer said you can do a full run of Atlas Fallen in around 35 hours. My playtime was exactly 49 hours and 33 minutes, but that was with making plenty of guides, so your game will take somewhere in between those two numbers. And as you can probably already gather, I played this on the Xbox Series X. So we'll start from the very beginning and look at character creation and the game's difficulty options. The game has a character creation, but it's a very basic one, choosing from a list of 12 presets, male and female, and you can customize basic things like hair, face shape, eyes, ears, nose, and you can just hit the random button as well. It's something the game could have spent a little longer on making your character more unique, but I personally don't pay too much attention to my character creation in-game, but I do realize it might be a bigger deal for some players. In terms of difficulty, we have three options, easy, normal, and hard. There are no achievements tied to difficulty in-game. The settings simply make enemies a little bit stronger and deal a bit more damage, but definitely gives them more health, and enemies are already quite tanky in-game, and I'm not sure if there's too much of an incentive to play on hard other than personal achievement. However, it does make every encounter a fight for life, as you can see in the gameplay, which is quite enjoyable. Whereas on easy, I can kill enemies without needing to really try or heal. Whereas on hard, I have to make use of all of my healing, have great parrying, and have to make sure to constantly dodge all the little spawn enemies. It makes having a good build all the more important on the harder difficulties. That leads us to the story, and the story of Atlas Fallen takes place in a world which is controlled by gods. An evil god called Thelos is the main one who requires the enslaved humans to mine for substances called essence. The essence is what gives the world life, and mining it is why the world is mostly sand and lacks any real life. As the player, you discover a gauntlet that has another god inside of it called Nial a much more friendly god who gives you his powers and in return you of course need to use those powers to defeat the evil and restore the world to what it should be. Now that is a very simplistic overview of the story and it can sound pretty cliched and many are concerned that this is going to be a forspoken clone, which it definitely is not. While the overall theme can be found in a thousand times in games and books and movies, if you can invest in the characters and the journey, like you can in this game, that it makes for a decent one, and I definitely had no issues with that. I like the characters, the relationship between you and Nial is not forced, and progression is, from the start to the final battle, very much enjoyable. The game's progression system is fairly standard for any RPG. You don't exactly level up your character with XP, but you can find something called Essence Stones, and you can also unlock perks by upgrading your armors. There are over 150 essence stones to find in game, either by finding them in chests, rewards for defeating enemies, mission rewards, and that kind of thing, and they are split into five categories. Damage, which in itself is self-explanatory. Tricks is usually you do one thing to create an effect. Say you successfully parry, you will crystallize your opponent. Survivability is all about defense or creating things that will negate damage. Momentum is about increasing your momentum gauge, which is super important during combat as it's the thing that unlocks the essence stones themselves in combat. The stones you have equipped don't do anything at the start of combat. As you gain momentum, the little blue bar in combat will increase and the essence stones will start to unlock the higher it gets. So it's definitely something you have to consider in battle. Lastly, you have healing again that is self-explanatory. The Essence Stones are also split into three tiers, each consisting of one ability with other being passive skills, and you can't equip any stone into any tier. Stones are tied to different tiers, so they are limited, but I guess it's to prevent you from being too powerful. The stones also have black edge ones, which give powerful effects, but also come with negative side effects as well. 
So it's up to you to find the perfect combination of stones for your character that makes mix of all five categories. You've also got to take into consideration your armor as each armor has unique bonuses to them that are unlocked if you have enough of the same amount of stone equipped or a certain combination of two stones. This is not something I entirely agree with as it does limit your essence stone choices and also your armor choices. So say if you want to equip the armor with the highest attack, it can limit the essence stones that you can equip. Now to begin with, I wasn't too sure on the essence stones as a system overall, but the more I played and the more I unlocked, it's definitely something I enjoyed more. But if they didn't have this system, to be honest, and they just had a standard skill system tree, I wouldn't have been too upset about that. Let's move on to the big one for me. It's the thing that makes or breaks any game, and as a guide maker and someone who spends 90% of games exploring every little nook, I have a strong opinion about, and that is the world and the gameplay and exploration. We'll talk about the map. Now, initially when I was playing, I thought the map was all right, but it was kind of small. And after fully exploring it and doing all the side missions and all the extras, I was at the end and it was around 20 hours or so into the game. And I was thinking that the game definitely needed to be a bit longer. But as you progress the story, a second map opens up. This time is different. It's an underground city map. Then a third, even bigger map opens up with even more stuff to do. There is even a proper town. Then a fourth map can be explored before the ending, so I was very surprised on how big the game actually was. The maps themselves all feel quite different and the variety is enough to make exploring not too boring. The world is also quite tall and makes certain parts pretty awesome to explore. It also allows you to take full advantage of your abilities where you traverse the map using your double jump. You have three dashes and you can also surf the sand as well. So that aspect is quite enjoyable. And the game's lighting and atmosphere also make the maps quite fun to explore and people will definitely get a lot of use out of the photo mode. As for things to do, you have main quests that require a lot of exploration of the world as you need to find upgrades for your gauntlet. There are also side quests and errands, which are your fairly standard find items or defeat enemies, that kind of thing. But some are for discovering secrets, some unlock armors and cosmetics, but it's definitely something I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of. The quests are also missable and I really enjoyed the way they work. So on the first map, you need to help out all the side characters as they will move to the second map if you progress the main story. And if you don't do the quests for the first map, then you can fail certain quests and you will miss certain items. But also if you've done the previous quest for an NPC, you can find them around the new map somewhere and they will greet you with another quest. So you build up a relationship across the game with recurring NPCs, which is nice. And the NPCs are all unique and have their own personalities. A few of the quests are a little bit lacking in payoff. One, for example, the thief who you meet at the very start of the game has multiple meetings throughout the game. And I feel like doing his series of quests should have had a bit more of a decent payoff but you help him the last time and it just kind of ends there. And there are quite a few quests that are the same way. So I wish the player was rewarded a bit more for doing longer running quests with NPCs. For exploration, it's very Ubisoft feeling. There are activities on the map quite easy to find, which repeat across all four maps and you need to unlock them by doing some basic things. And they're either unlock essence stones, cosmetics, treasure maps, which unless you're going for 100% completion, you might not miss too much if you decided to skip them. But if you're playing on a harder difficulty, I guess you would have to do those things in order to get a strong enough build for your character. So while I would have preferred a little bit more variety and definitely some more secrets or hard to find stuff, it wasn't too bad. The best thing to do in the game is probably the watchtowers, but there's not too many of them. And also while you're out exploring, you can get randomly attacked by the watcher and basically you get attacked by waves of enemies you need to defeat and doing so will reward you with some rarer essence stones. I enjoyed that as well, but it was quite rare and I'd definitely like to see that increase in frequency. That brings us nicely to combat then, and for me, it's probably the biggest issue in the game. 
While you're still getting used to the controls, combat is quite sluggish and awkward. The combination of buttons is confusing. The attacks, especially if it's a flying enemy, can be hard to maintain hits. There is a delay with every attack as well. I'm not too sure the reason for that, as it stops the ability to blitz enemies quickly, which is a little strange for a game that's quite fast-paced in combat otherwise. However, I think the biggest issue was actually the controls themselves, and after remapping them, it made a huge difference to combat. Whoever was in charge of the controls for the game clearly hadn't played too much with a controller before, but fortunately you can remap all the buttons except for the joysticks on console. So I switched the evade button to B instead of RB, switched the special attack to Y, regular and secondary attacks were RB and RT respectively, but the interact button was switched to X instead of B. And after that, it made a huge difference to the game. So I recommend switching that up as soon as you start. The only remaining issue, and it was a big one, is the auto-targeting system. For some reason, which I can't quite understand, you switch targets automatically using the right joystick. Now, unless you play without using your right stick, which is impossible, you're constantly switching targets, so it's almost unplayable during combat. You can disable auto-targeting in the menu, and it does help a lot, but it can still happen, so it's definitely something they need to fix as soon as possible. Again, it's quite clear they've never really played the game using a controller before, or it would have been an obvious issue that they would have changed. So again, make sure you disable auto-targeting when you are in the game. The main enemies in the game are called Wraith, and while they do have some variety, they're mostly all the same on how you defeat them, so I think that's something that could have been improved upon. But their abilities and how you defeat them can get quite repetitive. But combat is not quite as bad as I'm making it sound. There are of course positives to the combat, it's just the biggest issue in game. But after playing it for 50 hours, a lot of these issues are definitely something I've gotten used to. Lastly then, what about technical issues? Well, the game on Series X runs at 60fps at 1440p, but I do play with performance mode enabled and disabled every graphic feature in the menu. If you turn all those features on and focus on graphics instead of performance, you can see the game is really struggling to be playable on the Xbox Series X. But if you disable all those things, the game still looks very good on the performance mode. I had a few occasions where frames dropped and I experienced three crashes in total of my 50 hours, one issue with textures and one issue where the entire world turned black, but in total the stuff delayed the gameplay by like 5 minutes worth of restarts and so it wasn't really an issue. So playing while focusing on performance is definitely what you need to do. Lastly then guys, should you buy the game? The story and gameplay are enjoyable. You can easily invest in the characters and dialogue isn't too edgy, which is a problem with modern games. It's not going to blow you away with its innovation, and it's never claimed to be a huge big budget cinematic game, despite taking inspiration from God of War and Horizons games. But it is a very much enjoyable action RPG, exploring cool looking open worlds, doing side quests and upgrading your skills and improving your build. And if that's the kind of game that you enjoy then Atlas Fallen will definitely give you that and you won't have any problems starting and finishing the game 100%. I also didn't get the chance to play co-op as I'm usually a solo player but I have heard some great things from the co-op and that it is well done. I'll admit that some things could be a little more in depth, armor choices could be a bit better, having them split up into say helmets and boots like a standard RPG would so you can refine your builds even more and the activities on the map could be a bit more varied as well but it's definitely not too much of an issue to prevent you from playing and enjoying the game. The sandy desert is well done, the game looks really good and despite the amount of complaints I had about combat it's not too bad. And the one thing I didn't really mention about combat which I did really enjoy was the momentum system which you need to build up to unlock your essence stones in combat and it adds a little bit something different from other games and that is an aspect of combat which I did enjoy. So overall I think it could definitely be the start of a decent franchise and I would recommend playing this one. Guys, I hope this review was helpful in helping you to decide on whether or not to buy Atlas Fallen for yourself. If this guide was helpful, like and share the video would be a great help. And of course, leave your comments below about whether or not you are planning to buy the game. Thanks for watching and I have some guides coming out for Atlas Fallen as well. So look out for those and I will see you in the next one. Bye.